LinkedIn is, is messy, it's chaotic, right? And it's not just for hiring anymore, right? People post sales, they try to get you to give them referrals, do a free coffee chat, like there's just, it's really messy, right? Yeah. So what we believe is a lot better is an exclusive network, more of like a curated LinkedIn where companies don't have to be exhausted by receiving 200, 300 applications. They can attract and hire high potential pre-vetted talent very quickly and for a fraction of the cost that they could do it themselves or going through traditional methods. Adam, thanks for joining me in studio today. It's a pleasure to have you here. I want to hear uh, all about your company, Hired Hippo, your career history that led to its foundation, and kind of like some of the um, some of the things that you've been seeing through the lens of operating this HR-focused company, this recruiting-focused company, uh, in the last couple of years, you know, pre, post, during pandemic, whatever. So welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I saw you at that event, and... Uh connected and appreciate it. Yeah. So for our listeners, the back the background is um, you may, as this is being released in, in part for the gathering series um, that we do for people in uh, people in culture, you may have watched an episode or heard of an episode with our friend Martin Hawk. Um, and he is a super connector in the people and people and culture. People, space. people group. Yeah, that's what he does. People, people group. Um, so that was the event that we met at, uh, and we talked, or I talked to someone on your team about, you know, engaging you guys as a client of Hired Hippo years ago, it feels like. Uh, so it's good to reconnect. Absolutely. We still got to get you in for that demo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We need help. We need sales help. So we'll get to that. But, uh, so what is Hired Hippo? Let's just jump into that. Yeah. So Hired Hippo is a place for companies that are startups or SMBs to attract and hire high potential pre-vetted talent very quickly and for a fraction of the cost that they could do it themselves or going through traditional methods. So I like that, like the the, the quick access to on-ramp, you know, talent. Um, give me a background. I guess let's let's start there. Let's say, okay, so you guys make it easy for people to find higher quality talent quicker and get them up and running. That's the idea. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So how do you do it? So it kind of came through my own pain. I mean, I've been in the recruiting space for the last 20 years. Tell me about your pain, brother. <laughs> hiring is a pain. Honestly, hiring touches everyone. Um, at some point in your career, you will hire someone or get hired, right? It's just inevitable. Um, even if you start your own thing, you know, customers are hiring you. Right. So, um, you know, it was, it was my own pain working in-house and um, working for an agency and then starting my own recruitment agency where I realized that at some point um, companies kind of uh, graduate from us and they go off onto their own, you know, try to recruit themselves, that kind of thing. And uh, what they were all telling me is like, hey, like we need to do it because of budget restraints and we want to bring everything in-house and kind of like own the data and own, you know, how uh, candidates perceive us as a brand. But the tools out there aren't very good, um, LinkedIn and Indeed. So how we do things really differently is we have the philosophy that alignment is the most important part about hiring. Um, alignment is missing from traditional job boards, recruiting, doing it yourself, referrals. Align, uh, break that down. What do you mean yeah. by alignment? So alignment is where it kind of goes back to like Maslow's hi hierarchy of needs, right? Um, candidates are looking for a certain thing um, in order to change jobs, in order to progress their career and, and pick the right career move. Um, most people actually don't make the right career move, so they keep hopping back and forth and it looks really bad. Um, and you know, it was either a result of them picking the wrong role or being presented with the wrong role or so sold on the wrong role. And so alignment is where candidates are interested in career opportunities based on work environment, the job that they're going to be doing. So do I want to move from an SDR to an AE? Um, do I want to work from a leadership role down to an individual contributor? And then the compensation, obviously, like what are the benefits? Um, you know, on, on all those things. And mm -hmm. so 
by figuring that out, we were able to present very high quality um, premium job opportunities to candidates and attract them sort of like faster than typical recruiters can and companies can do do themselves. Yeah, it's sort of, it's interesting because like, definitely like looking for a job, finding a job and then going through that onboarding or that the recruit, the triage, you know, the kind of like hiring companies, hiring processes to then be sat at a desk in a company and then be tooled up to like do your job is like such a cumbersome process for every company, it seems like. And, and anyone... I like this idea that you, that you brought up of, of kind of like how people want to internalize companies want to internalize HR or, or I guess recruiting as a function. And often cases, the justification is reduced OPEX, but the truth is it becomes a little bit more expensive and or shittier as a process if you're going to own it. Um, but I think there's also that like possibly because of the cost, a lot of mistrust in recruiting companies that, you know, especially smaller like SMBs might have is that, wow, we got to pay three months or six months of someone's salary, whatever it is, to bring them on board. And we're paying that to these guys whose job it is to just make that fee and place people. How do we know that they have a vested interest in our success? And how do they find the right person for us? Like, I, I would think there's a lot of mistrust with smaller firms, especially. There, there's a ton of distrust in the industry. I think it's like, it's looked at as, you know, that cheesy car salesman type of role. I mean, it's been around like since before the, well, forever, but like traditionally more like 70s and 80s, right? Where um, they didn't, you know, LinkedIn didn't exist and things like that, right? Um, and I think it's primarily because of the direction that the industry went and like a lot of, you know, bad actors in the space. I mean, just trying to throw heads at seats and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, not being invested or... It, it, um, involved in the business for the long term. Um, and so, yeah, when I started my agency, I mean, we, we run on one KPI, which is repeat business. Right. And you know, that value, that mission, um, really changes like the way that we approach our customers, um, in terms of like what customers you work with and, and things like that. And so, um, trust is, is something that is like earned over time, obviously, like it's not something that you can see right away. And so, it's it's um tough to show your work in recruiting because it's you know if you're a lawyer you're like hey you know it, it would we take won me. that case yeah we won that case it would take me this many hours to do this project um but in recruiting it's years of you know networking assessing candidates like you know just understanding from an experience perspective right and mm -hmm. so um the way that the industry started was that you know we would just pay upon success right and so that kind of like dampered i think a lot of the trust because um there's no you know concept or understanding of how long that that can potentially take it could take a long time could take a little bit of time and so um i believe that like the utopia is essentially like bringing in your own recruiting uh you know, superpower in inside your company. Um, it's just the tools available to you to do that, like aren't there. Mm -hmm. Some people don't know how to know how to hire. Some people don't. And if you're a growing startup or SMB, like getting everyone on your team to be able to to hire in a leadership role is like is pretty key. It's just you got to give them the tools to do it. It's funny because you mentioned sales. Like you said, SDR is a, is it just the, like off the cuff as a as a potential kind of you know hiring. Uh, identity but like um i've always looked at this kind of like finding people as a sales role if you're doing if you're a recruiter and you're looking for people to fill or candidates to fill a role um you have to sell those candidates on that employer and you have to sell of course that candidate to the employer who is ultimately you know you're working for internally or otherwise um Tell me a little bit about that and your personal experience. Like as, as someone who, you know, helps people find each other, uh, how does salesmanship come into it in terms of like this relationship formation side of things? Yeah, I mean, it's a bit of push and pull, right? Like you have to be able to attract, but also repel to get the right talent, right? So you can't just be selling. I mean, I, I don't think people take like direct selling seriously anymore it's it's very relationship based it, like you know as i mentioned like trust happens over time right so um yeah i mentioned salespeople because they're more than just 
boxes to check. It's, you know, it's a personality fit. It's how people show up. It's, you know, I always look at like passion, trust, attitude for any role, but like you really see that in, in, um, in sales. And so, um, when you're recruiting for a company, you have to understand the company as a whole. You have to understand the business problem that the company needs to solve, not just surface level of, you know, what's on the website or what somebody said in an article two weeks ago. Like you just really need to understand like what's worked, what hasn't worked. Why is the company even hiring for this candidate? Mm -hmm. Could you go a different path? Um, yeah, you have to understand because because it's not just like exactly you're not hiring for widget factories, right? It's yeah. like I need an operator to pull this lever every third of a second. Like he's got to go super quick. That's all I need. Cheaper than a machine. Got to get a human. Yeah. So for office work, you know, uh, or white color work, uh, there's a lot more at play, and interrelational skills are really important. Because I, I find this like people in roles can. Um, if they have the capacity, you know, they can learn stuff that they didn't know coming into a job on the job and they can um, get better at processes and functional stuff if they have the capacity. Uh, but their interrelational skills are what, you know, allows a team to form and people to rely on each other at, in that team and do great stuff together. So for innovation-based teams, you know, that's really, really, really important. Um who typically are the clients of Hired Hippo? So we strictly work with SMBs, small, medium-sized businesses, and startups. Um, Founder-led, they could be bootstrapped working out of their kitchen table or Series A looking to raise Series B. Um, so all the candidates that we have and we've, we've vetted, which is over 35,000 candidates that are um, mostly local within Canada, um, looking for their next opportunity, but being picky about it. Like, you know, we always say like, we're kind of as picky or selective as our, um, like as our customers, which is the companies as well as the candidates. Right. So it's quality over quantity, um, making sure that it's the right role. It's going to actually, um, be a good trajectory in their career. It's going to be the right place for them, um, to excel. Mm -hmm. Um, because like, you know, work environment, is a reason that you know a lot of people don't work out like it might be the 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 right person wrong spot kind mm -hmm. of thing mm -hmm. what okay so and what are the roles typically like are there particular types of role that you fill or that you guys have found yourself aligning with post pandemic yeah currently we focus on gtm roles go to market so sales marketing customer success we want to own the space in Canada as like the best, like already met with pre-qualified recruiter ready talent, um, for those roles. Um, and for those small, medium sized businesses, but the how, how did you not... arrive on that identity as like a particular encanchment of people that are both being looked for and also that maybe are, are difficult to recruit for? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, we, we tried a lot of different things. And um, quite honestly, it's one of the harder roles to get right because you don't really know if somebody's going to be great until they get into that role. So the alignment piece, like part of what we do is so critical for those roles, right? Um, again, it's not just the boxes that you would check, right? Like with a developer, do they have the right tech stack, that mm -hmm. kind of thing, which my agency does a lot of. We do a lot of executive search there um developer tech you know product roles and we also tried to test them out on our product and what we realized is that like those candidates don't actively seek opportunities at different companies unless somebody kind of reaches out to them directly and taps yeah. them on the shoulder totally. hey we want you for this role oh my god i never thought of changing my job <laughs> yeah i can make more money it's uh I can make some money it's exciting to be recruited, right? So, I don't know, but nine times out of ten, those random inquiries are bullshit. I mean, at least that I'll speak from my own experience, like the LinkedIn messages. Oh my god, this would be great. We have this company for you. No, you don't. <laughs> you just want me in your database. That's another thing that happens. A lot of recruiters looking to like kind of see, oh well, who's interested in what, so that we can kind of earmark them for positions as they come available. 
So it's like building a refined database out of LinkedIn, you know? Yeah. You hit the nail on the head because like LinkedIn is is messy. It's chaotic, right? Like, I mean, I can barely get through my LinkedIn messages. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just for hiring anymore, right? People post sales. They try to get you to, you know, get give them referrals, do a free coffee chat. Like there's just, it's really messy, right? Yeah. So what we believe is a lot better is an exclusive um you know network more of like a curated linkedin um where companies don't have to be exhausted by receiving 200 300 applications they can you know sign up on board with us we'll learn about their business we'll learn about the role we'll make sure that they're posting the role correctly um which is something that you know those other traditional job boards don't do specifically mm -hmm. and yeah yeah so each each role is defined differently and then candidates kind of don't really focus on those details and they try and spray and pray and hope that it works. Exactly. We don't even let candidates um, quick apply or... Uh, yeah, it's you know, a waste of time. From an employer perspective? Yeah. Jeez. And then people, once in a while, I'll, I'll get a candidate reaching out to me and being like, hey, I never heard from you. I'm like, well, my job description says specifically anyone who doesn't include a cover letter explaining why they think this is a fit for them with a demonstrable knowledge of my company, you know, uh, is, is not even, we don't even read that. I'm not going to read a resume. What the hell is a resume in this day and age? You know, like it's, it's just, it could be totally lies. And I don't care if you got a PhD or a master's, you know, you got to be able to just do the thing that we, 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 uh, need done. And, uh, and yeah, some people are a little miffed cause they're kind of like, but I clicked apply. Like I did the work. I'm yeah. Like, what? And from that experience, you want me to hire you? <laughs> you think that's demonstrating initiative because you clicked a button? Button's not enough. Um, so yeah, it's it's a huge service to be able to pre-vet you know candidates for employers and get a better understanding of what the employers need um, to be able to match make. Yeah, I think like you said, like it's um, we're kind of like in this time where you know do less work, right? Um, to like you know, get that introduction and introductions take time. And, you know, I think there's a lot of bad advice out there, but if candidates have to do more work, obviously not like unpaid assignments and, um, you know, like astronomical amount of work, but if, um, if they're not putting in the work to like do an assignment and understand the business, then how do they know even if they're going to like it there? Mm -hmm. Right. Like mm -hmm. it's just as much of a risk for the candidate as it is for the company, um, and again, more alignment that, that people have, um, before you get started, the less likely that anything's gonna, you know, falter or not work out. Right. So I want to pick your brain on something All You're right. focused on, uh, like you said, go to market, right? So people that can enable companies to find, um, connection with business. Um, and also if you're working with SMBs and, and, you know, technology companies, I'm sure a bulk of them are SaaS. So the idea is, you know, salespeople that are doing B2B sales probably a lot of the time. Um, what have you learned about, I know this is generifying things and you said it's specific, you know, there's details though that we need to get into about uh, salespeople in terms of commonalities of skill sets that people may find complementary to sales as a role. Uh, and if you have to bring people who have not sold directly before, like enabled a financial transaction for a company before, but they had a skill set that was complementary that you uh, feel confident uh, enables them to do sales. How, any Anything that you can speak to on that topic? I mean, the easy answer is like passion or industry knowledge. So um, typically when I talk about people that are in career transition, right? So um, you know, maybe they worked in food and beverage and then working for a food and beverage related tech company, like could be a transaction, like could be a good, um, sorry, uh, opportunity for them to, um, hit the ground running because they understand sort of like the, you know, what's behind the curtain, the nuts and bolts of that particular industry and how to talk to those customers. Mm -hmm. Um, the rest can be taught if, the onboarding is there if they have the right attitude like some people need a lot of onboarding some people need like very little like it just depends on the person and how resourceful they are right mm -hmm. so um but there's definitely a few things that i've seen that are like very rare i mean if somebody doesn't have the sales experience they don't know if they like sales for example oh, yeah. um it's gonna be you a know nightmare. 
it's going to be really hard. Yeah. Like I, I, I've hired people without recruiting experience before and, um, we don't really, we don't do it anymore. And the reason is because a lot of the transition to becoming a good recruiter is understanding that you like the industry, you like the hard work, you like the ups and downs and then you can handle that sort of like yeah. high stress, um, emotional roller coaster and, and chat with people on a personal level and people think that they want that, but they don't really want that. So that's, you know, where I worry. Another example is um, when startups are trying to hire uh, people that don't have startup experience, it's very rare that I've ever seen that worked out. People freak out. And it's the thing, it's startup people don't really realize, especially if you're like a career startup person, from a founder perspective, if you've just always dealt with new co's and like all the problems to do with new co formation, finding customers, uh, convincing them to part with money, going after investment rounds, whatever that stuff is. And, you know, you're not looking at systems and process and regularity. And in fact, you kind of uh, may abhor those things. So if you bring on people to your team who are like, they just want the week to be the week and they'll, they'll kill it in that nine to five, but they're not overcommitted, uh, you know, to like sharing your passion for the necessity of actualizing your vision then they're going to seem like, you know, they're tying you down. <laughs> and I think I've seen it here where at Startwell, we've had a number of, uh, obviously we were startup aligned. And, and since our foundation, the, the mission here was to enable early stage companies to kind of like uh, pair program in a way where we had small companies together in the same space, in fact, in, in the beginning. And I was testing that proximity question uh, as an enabler. So we'd have like a company that doesn't have, let's call it, um, I don't know, someone in finance, but they're next to a team that has like a really strong finance team. Um, the idea is that they can learn what they need from that other team to hire for or develop internally as a skill set. And that was hugely successful for a while. But we as an operating team learned a lot about all these other early uh, stage companies that were sharing the space to see, well, yeah, what, what can they do? What can't they do? And what are the frustrations to you know, and and perhaps even in some cases, the um, inhibitors to speed and agility. Uh, a lot of that is just miscommunication and misalignment of vision. Absolutely, because you have these founders that have you know their idea of how things should be, um, but often cases they're not managers, they're not communicators, they're not relationship people at all. You know, and yet they're wearing so many hats. It's hard to take those hats off and put it on someone else's head. Yeah, it's tough to get the context like you've never done it before. So like, yeah, to, to what you're saying, like you kind of need to be in it to know how how tough it is and what to do. Like, if you know, there are pivots and stressful situations, although a lot of startups hate that word pivots. But, um, you know, there's just like things that happen off the cuff, right? Yeah, so, I've had that. I've had staff just like freak out on me, you know, <laughs> freak out on me. Like this one lady, she just couldn't understand why, this is years ago, but she couldn't understand why I didn't have a number of paper documents for her to fill out every day. And I was like, but, and she was like, there's no process here. And I'm like, well, process is digital, man. Mm -hmm. You know, we have three different softwares that we use for these things that you want to create paper records for. And then she's like, but then how do I look through all these documents? I was like, yes. <laughs> well yeah that's one of the things i mean like that's why companies need to do these tests right like even if you say like hey i'm comfortable with technology like how do you use it how do you interact with it do you know if you're using a mac do you know like the quick commands like right they're just some things that like it's really hard to so tell these are things you guys go into i recommend to my clients to basically do an interview like a podcast like this mm -hmm. get to know the person on like a super deep level mm -hmm um take a lot of interest um but be like you know don't try to trick them just like be engaging right right and then from an interview standpoint like really kind of like paint the picture of what it's going to be like in the in the day to day the good the bad you know what's worked out before what hasn't i mean transparency is just missing it's so important and most people leave their current job because it wasn't as explained to them in the interview or so they say that's their side of the story. God, so much focus on the interview. <laughs> and it's like the interview is supposed to give you this crystal ball into, you know, the organization. No, I mean, do some diligence. Like how many candidates do diligence on the company that they're about to, you know, spend their waking life at? Very few. They're not like 
they're not necessarily kind of like aligning themselves with opportunity when they come into a job and expect to be, you know, spoon fed everything um, and, and also motivated. That's a, another side thing. I don't know if you're finding that in um, amongst candidates that you're trying to place, but like there we're seeing it a lot where a lot of people are um, these days, especially in their twenties, let's say, let's call it out. I'm going to be a generationalist uh, are looking for like, moms and dads at work yeah they're looking for leaders to be parents yeah you know and um and that's that's not something that's sustainable you know organizations can't invest especially smbs can't invest in bringing uh, employees up to scale up to speed on everything going on in the company because so much is happening and each worker each person especially we're talking about startups uh each person is doing something that has a need for autonomy in a way because they got to drive their own you know, mandate because they're working on behalf of five people that don't exist in every business unit. So it, it can be very difficult, I'm sure, for a lot of people, not necessarily the people that want only that stasis of like, you know, the life at a bank, nine to five, clock in, clock out, but also the people that feel like they, there's constantly a knowledge gap and like they can't get ahead because they need to be told everything. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I agree and I, I see it as, um, you know, again, the, the alignment piece, it's like Kim Scott wrote this book, Radical Candor, and it's, you know, a part in it where she talks about there's a lid for every pot. So. No, there's a plate for every <laughs> missing lid. Yeah, <laughs> that too. Um, and so it's just like the wrong person, wrong company. And so, you know, a lot of these, uh, it happens at the beginning stages where either the candidate doesn't dig into it themselves or what they should be doing. Maybe, you know, they don't, they didn't get a career coach. They didn't really assess what were the good things and the bad things, what I was doing before, or mm -hmm. what am I actually like, you know, passionate about and motivated by. Um, because if there's like misalignment between that person and their leader, like they're just like, it's just not going to be a fit. It's going to be a constant, like, you know, struggle or that person's just going to try because they're there and then and then fall off so it's really like the wrong fit and these things obviously are extremely costly um to do it wrong and that's what we want to get rid of we want to say like hey stop our we tell our customers like look you don't have to recruit like skip recruiting don't worry about sourcing and attracting talent we do that for you our right. app and right. automatically attracts people and um doesn't have just a job description that's just like words on a paper right it's all the things that you would want to know about an employer before making the jump. So it's like, here's the um, insights and information on the company, what series that they add, videos, you know, images. It's not just that those words on the paper. So it's very intentful. Mm -hmm. And then the company as well. It's not a resume like resumes, like you said, are are you know they're in old and traditional and a poor predictor of success. We want to know more information, right? Um, about where this candidate's coming from. It's, and then you can make better decisions, better choices. It's funny. I had this one candidate that kept coming up over three years for different jobs. And uh, she didn't provide much information about herself. And, you know, as part of our process, we always kind of will review applications in line with a little bit of just like a Google search. Like, who is this person? What's their social footprint? You know, what do they like doing? How do they interact? Are they tech enabled? Do they have 10 event, uh, ten different profiles on different platforms? Um, are they engaging uh, in any, whatever, you Google someone's name. And this person kept coming up in different ways that was so surprising and weird. Like in terms of the number of different types of career that they seem to be pushing out into the world over the two year period or three year period of applying for different jobs with us. And it's like, wow, this is like 10 people in one person, but it's not like they have simultaneously, you know, interested in different things. It's more like this person was trying out different hats and they weren't fitting. And it's really interesting. But um, so, yeah, putting that information, that's another thing to note. Rather than expecting employers to be able to triage your digital footprint and define some sort of unified identity, uh, it's better to put that into a system like yours and say you're going to be presented in a living, breathing way, you know, that's uh, that's more concise for the person looking at it and easier to digest. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of bad actors out there. I mean, you talk to everyone, they've got a horror story for hiring, right? Um, there are 
there are stories and a lot more than you'd think in terms of like, you know, we were paying this person. They also had another full time job. We were sure. paying this person. I'm hearing that from people on this podcast yeah. in the PNC world that like I just had a chat with someone today this morning who said that they had an employee that had five no four jobs four full-time simultaneous jobs yeah it happens and um people like kind of you know uh, sales like saying that you'd reach out to this many people and you know recording it in in your 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 uh, CRM, but right. like it's actually not true once you just BS leads they're like yeah, yeah I don't know they're not emailing me back man there's there's a ton of those right and um they really shouldn't be in those industries maybe they shouldn't have been at that company maybe okay wait, let's know. pause and let's talk about okay. this example okay and i want to talk about uh because you mentioned the other day to me that you represent um you know some candidates that are comfortable with uh, 100 percent commission positions in mm -hmm. sales yeah so that's an interesting identity to me you know um, and partly, you know, you mentioned like, you know, uh, people hiring should conduct interviews. Well, that's kind of what we're doing. Cause I want, I want you guys to find me some, uh, some salespeople. So I find it fascinating that, uh, there are people that, cause there should be that are, you know, commissions only focus cause you can make a lot more money with the right structure, um, in that sort of a role, but it requires a confidence in your abilities to be able to actually knock it out of the park. Right. Yeah. Um, so I have a question about those people, like who fit, are there character traits or otherwise anything you could say about the canon of people that you uh, represent that, you know, are commission only salespeople? Yeah. So um, just for context for the audience, I mean, the reason we know is because that's one of the questions. Um, what are your salary expectations? What do you want as your on target earnings, which is like total comp and um, would you be open to commission only roles? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so for those that select, you know, we're open in, in, um, commission only roles, it's less than 6% of the entire talent pool. And we can say that like, just in, I would think or, it'd be even less than that. I in, mean, like in Canada, but it's interesting because in sales, I mean, people need to know, I would think they'd be driven by recompensation, right? So it's a very specific kind of motivator for people, most people. And that's an interesting thing, taking the flip stat saying that 94% of candidates looking for jobs are not primarily driven by recompensation. Yeah. Right? They, um, you know, I think it's a, like a bit historic or, um, you know, where you are in your life or, you know, uh, um, you know, just, just, I guess, having, um, being put in like a, you know, situation where you can take a low salary, but if, you know... Founders are on commission only. Some recruiters that start their own business are on commission only. Real estate agents, uh, you know, there's a lot of these mm -hmm. industries that are commission only. So there are people that are kind of used to it and they like to know that they're earning each dollar that they brought in. Mm -hmm. um, but because of like inflation and, you know, the cost of living and all these things, um, the the interest in commission only jobs has gone less and less like over my career, like by far. Right. Mm -hmm. So just like less people are willing to, um, start that. So the idea is to like, kind of create like a good balance that, you know, based on how long sales might take. And this is some, one of the conversations we have with employers, which is like, they're like, well, you know, what should I pay for this base? Well, first of all, do you want to be pay the highest base out of any other company? Do you want to pay in the in the middle? Do you want to pay a bit lower? Like what's your budget first of all? And then, you know, kind of look into, well, what is the likelihood that this person's going to start earning commission and when's that going to be? Because if it's the longer it takes for them to earn a commission, you know, and they, they're not making any money and that's like effects of the product or the service. Mm -hmm. um, it's just going to be harder on them depending on what, sort of like cost of living that they currently have. Right. So these are all factors that I like, you know, I recommend people look into. Um, and I also say like, if you could pay a million dollars salary in base, you'd have access to almost every single person, right? Because you would eliminate the compensation requirement or question. Um, and anything lower you go to zero commission only, it's just a smaller pool, but you know, depending on your business or how you're structured, um, you know, being able to, to balance the right person. That's and that's interesting, but the commission only thing is very interesting to me because it's about performance and about the confidence and performance, you know, 
Like, I mean, it's a particular function in a business, not everything. Every role can't be performance-based. Uh, some things are more tricky to gauge performance on, right? And yet we live in this world, especially with remote work and, and hybridized teams, is like there's a lot of organizations that have no clue what performance means anymore because they're they're creating these sort of metrics to say, well, we don't know if Judy's happy. And uh, we, we really, I mean, she she's not in the office to bring us bagels on Thursday, so we don't know if we like her anymore. And uh, so we can't game the system by saying we like her and she, you know, she's, she's a happy person to have around. So I guess it's only about performance and like, she's really bad at turning things in on time. Is that performance, you know, or when you were all in the office together, her bringing in the bagels actually made the whole team perform 20% better, you know? Yeah. Uh, these things are, are really kind of crazy right now to, to see people assessing. Yeah. And like, you know, remote work and office, like these are questions that we get from our clients all the time. And this is why we sort of realized that like just a product doesn't work, just a service. You kind of need both to complete the trifecta of like what we would call utopia hiring or getting as close to perfect hiring as possible. And, um, you know, the um, productivity or performance is, you know, it's it's like uh company and person specific, right? Like how does that leader think about what outcomes they want? Every job is outcome based, mm -hmm. whether you're serving coffee, like, okay. Um, you know, I used to go to Tokyo smoke a lot for coffee and like they, the way that they put it together and describe the coffee, like that was to me like an 11 star experience. Right. And people would go back, um, because of the science that they described behind the coffee is an example. That right? just went away. It went up in smoke, right? Yeah, they I guess turned into just like um, so cannabis stores and no more coffee. But it was yeah, great. For, for our listeners outside of Ontario, outside of Canada, um, a few years ago, when let's call it 2018, 19, when cannabis was about to be legalized, there was all these companies that were questioning what the rollout of legalization would look like, and this company started very very smartly. If I'm correct, it was the son of someone already in cannabis yeah. uh, who started this brand. And the brand was supposed to be a lifestyle brand for cannabis-minded people. And um, they focused on caffeination, which is interesting, but really geeked out on, like you were saying, on how they uh, provided a stellar cafe experience, espresso arc experience. Uh, and the posit was we built a network of cafes and those cafes could be distribution points for cannabis, depending on how legalization happens and whether we can sell weed in those shops. Uh, and then it turned out they couldn't mix function and it's like retail is retail only and all this stuff happened with the legislation. But uh, they got acquired for tons and tons of money. Yeah, 500 million, I think. And to, then all of those yeah. shops died and had not provided a database of customers. So it was one of these kind of like overhyped brand extrapolations uh, that didn't necessarily provide access to market. And it was a weird thing because it's like, we'd all love to have those espresso bars back. Oh, it was You amazing. know what I mean? Like, yeah. They had this concept where it was clothing, coffee, like really well done coffee and tea. Like they had, you know, I talked to, and just exceptional people that worked there. Um, I always say like baristas, chefs, servers, make incredible workers, like, mm -hmm. They just paid so much attention to detail, but for whatever reason, Tokyo Smoke was able to hire these people that were like, you know, um, almost like a sommelier. Like they just went to school for I don't can't, don't know what's called for coffee, but they went to school for that. And then the vessels for for cannabis, and um, you know, as that transition that you just explained was happening people would come in looking for cannabis and they'd be like, no, no, we don't have this here. It's at a different location. Link, we're just coffee. So I think that confusion started coming, but, um, you know, it was, it was close to our office and I was like obsessed with, uh, that experience. I can't even remember how I went on this tangent, but yeah. yeah. Um, that's yeah. another coffee shop now, right? Is that the little shed in the side of the building? Oh, another so one you're talking that about? too, but they had another one on queen street. Right. Right west that i don't know what it is right now but uh or i can't remember maybe like a uh, warby parker or something okay. i don't know it's probably not there. i don't know how we got on this cannabis uh angle or at <laughs> least the tokyo smoke thing but i think you were talking about kind of like the um oh, well it came from compensation and uh performance we we're talking about performance maybe you were going to say something about how uh their staff you know were particularly adept at like relating the value of what they were selling. Yeah. I, I think it was know. along those lines. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but we did talk about your office being next to that shop. So tell me a little bit about your outfit. So Hired Hippo consists of what? As an organization, how many people are you and uh, and how much of a digital platform are you and, and, and where did the people come into that operating plan? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we're super small. We're 10 people. Um, we're kind of staying small deliberately because... Um, I don't believe it's the size of your team, but like kind of the way that everyone works together to execute. And, um, we want to also feel startup cause like all of our clients are like working out of, you know, either very small or just raise some money. Right. Mm -hmm. And so just understanding, um, what they go through culturally and from that perspective is important to us. Um, the other thing is like, we are really focused on quality over quantity. So it's like, what customers do we take in? How can we verify, you know, certain companies for our candidates to make sure that like, hey, we've done the due diligence, like these people are going to take your interview serious, they're going to give you feedback, like we guarantee candidates get feedback. It's one of the reasons that they apply through us mm -hmm. um, over anywhere else, right? They know that they're not going to be one of 200 applications, they're going to be a top contender um, for that particular company. Um, and so, yeah, it's a big answer to the size of the team. But um, yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty small. And kind of just staying that way for now. So your software is like a tool to enable your recruiters to work or? Um, no, but I mean, it, it does do that job too for my, for my agency, but what it does um, more specifically for the, the, the greater community is um, provides direct access to founders, HR managers, hiring managers that are hiring on their own. So sales manager, customer success manager um, that is looking for top talent um, the day that they posted their job without having to go through the schlog of waiting for applications and yeah, yeah. or reaching out to candidates, not hearing back, you know, going through 200 applications, making sure. So wait, so your staff don't necessarily, they're not necessarily recruiters or they're filling that database of people, but they're not necessarily like doing interviews with people and stuff. That's the the role of the software. The, the software um, verifies and vets candidates based on that alignment, yeah. then certain customized questions that each employer has. Um, and then we further take the verification vetting process because we meet everyone in person. Um, so we do meet them as recruiters. And then, you know, if candidates don't show up properly or, you know, uh, like ghost an interview, aren't, you know, honest about certain things, um, then they won't be a higher hippo candidate. We believe that there's 20% of top talent in their field. Mm -hmm. um, and that's within our exclusive network. And that's the benefit that we provide our companies because they don't have to go through candidates that aren't a good fit, right? So um, our team of developers um, and, you know, ops and recruiters make up that that team. Um, we don't have an issue in terms of getting candidates because we've created this, like, carrot. Um, so at the beginning, we worked a lot on how to get candidates in, learning what candidates wanted, why they would um, apply to a job. I mean, if you saw a job on... Uh, Indeed or LinkedIn, 87% of talent don't actually apply to that job, mm -hmm. right? So the person you want might not be applying. Whereas we figured out how to get the person you want to apply to your job uh, with our product. So we don't have a problem of getting talent and talent tell other talent because they're like, this is an experience I haven't experienced before. Mm. Um, and so our recruiters just like manage, support, help um, our current clients um, hire the best people. And that's kind of how we're set up. And you're filling roles primarily in Toronto or across Canada or globally? Across Canada, most of our clients are in Toronto. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we do have a bunch of clients like in the States, especially like companies that are here that are, have opened offices um, in the US. But most of our clients don't need to hire like this high volume, right? They need one person a year, maybe one person a month or two people a month, right? Because there are companies that are looking to grow at that stage with high quality, very intentional hires. Um, and so, you know, we've just found that like Toronto companies tell other Toronto companies and that's been a bulk of our clients, but across Canada. It's great. If you grow by word of mouth and you're a good thing. Um, okay. A couple last questions and I think we can wrap this cause it's, it's been a pretty insightful conversation already. 
Um, I didn't ask you in the beginning necessarily, but your career path leading to founding this company. Um, so give me the highlights along the journey. Yeah. So, um, I was kind of just somebody who like was unsure what I wanted to do. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, my parents, um, like, you know, I'm a first generation Canadian, right. My parents came here when they were super young. So, um, I didn't want to spend like the little money that they had on, um, getting an education that I wouldn't use. Right. right, right. Um, I actually worked for uh, at a record store that was super popular in, uh, young and Eglinton in Toronto, um, called record world, uh, like back in the day. And, um, there'd be a lot of people that would come in with degrees like MBAs, um, bachelor degrees and apply to be at the record store. And I'm like, I'm already working here. Right. So just trying to figure out what I wanted to do, what my career path was like, wasn't super obvious. Um, I wanted to be a vet like my entire life. And I worked at a vet clinic for seven years, but didn't have like the school smarts or the chemistry interest or passion to continue that job. Like I just knew that like, okay, I'm not passionate about this piece. Um, but I am passionate about the business side of being a vet and owning a vet shop and the experience and, you know, how people show up and how they leave and, you know, helping them with something that's super important. So mm -hmm. I was offered a job as a recruiter and I was like, oh, what is a recruiter? And they said, Hey, like, you need to help this company hire the best person for their job and you'll get paid for it. Right. So I started full commission. That's how I like learned the business. Um, no money at all. Like just didn't spend anything you know, lived at home with my parents, like, you know, just, I was lucky to be able to do that. But, um, uh, I also just, you know, lived very minimally, right. For the first many years. Mm -hmm. Um, and then just like excelled at it. Right. So, um, I just realized that I was really good at it and, um, that's kind of how I came into recruiting and I just became super passionate. And I believe that it's an industry that is, you know, I mean, cheesy as it sounds like right for disruption. Sure. Um, I just think that the way that we've been doing it the last many years is boring, unfair, you know, all those things. Right. And there is a great space for great companies to hire talent. That's like super aligned to them and their mission and their values and candidates to make that right career move. And so that's, uh, that's sort of like our vision of what we want to do. Brilliant. And then lastly, uh, one tip, if there's just one tip you can give people looking for a job and then one tip that you could give people looking to hire any role generic. I think it's the best, uh, the same thing for both sides, um, which is essentially, um, to know the business problem that you solve. Right. So as a candidate, um, there's a lot of people that uh, like aren't really sure of the value that they can provide to companies and they don't know how to express that. And that's where a lot of interviews fail and falter, right? They can't clearly identify um, what I'm great at and what I can be successful at. Um, Seth Godin says that like you have sort of like this one superpower. It's like figuring out that one superpower. And then for companies that need to hire, it's like, who do you need that's pointy enough that has that one superpower? Sure, they might have other things, but like, what are they going to be really good at to, um, you know, change the game? It's like you don't need a mass generalist. You need someone who can have the attitude and, um, you know, curiosity to figure out other things. But they've, they've got to be one thing that they're super um, intentful about and passionate about. It's great advice, man. Thanks, Thanks for joining me on the podcast. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Yeah, pleasure. Um,